Hi, I'm Brian Molloy with Apogee. Welcome to part two of our four-part series, Applying Universal Principles of Design to APIs. We are considering ideas drawn from the book, Universal Principles of Design. Our approach is simple. We'll introduce a design principle, view it in the context of our experiences with APIs, and based on what we see, we'll create a checklist of best practices. Let's get started with our second session, part two, don't overwhelm. Our goal in this session is to punctuate the well-known maxim that more isn't always better. Engineers often view flexibility as a limitless virtue. In general, however, there is a trade-off between flexibility and usability. Think of a simple remote control for one device versus a complicated universal remote for multiple devices, or a standalone screwdriver versus a Swiss army knife. In each case, the more flexible design is also more difficult to learn and use. In the world of APIs, a flexible API leads to more diverse apps, whereas better usability leads to more initial developer adoption. Do we have to choose between the two? Yes and no. In our experience, it is often difficult to anticipate the future needs of API-dependent apps. Even the most focused initiatives require significant flexibility in API design. Our feeling is that APIs are more like Swiss Army knives than single-purpose tools. So even with the flexibility-usability trade-off in mind, good API designs will favor flexibility. But we also want usability, so what do we do? Because we want to deal with the systematic burden of flexibility, we must be disciplined about eliminating unnecessary complexity from other parts of our API design. We need to optimize usability. In other words, an API must be flexible, but it does not have to be unnecessarily complex. We're aware of the flexibility-usability trade-off. We know good APIs are inherently flexible, and we must optimize usability. The flexibility-usability trade-off principle is the foundation for this session. In fact, it amplifies the importance of the remaining design principles. As they create applications, developers make hundreds or even thousands of simple decisions. The faster they make the decisions, the faster an app gets made. The better the decisions they make, the better the app. Hicks Law states that for simple stimulus response tasks, the time it takes to make a decision is a function of the number of available options. The more options we give our developers about our API, the longer it will take them to build apps. Let's take a look at an example where unnecessarily, unnecessary complexity collides with Hicks Law. DIG allows their API users to indicate the response format in two ways, through the accept header or through an optional type param. Because there are two options, developers must also account for the case when the options conflict. For a developer trying to make a simple decision about a response format, this design will slow him down. Foursquare, on the other hand, gives developers one simple way to specify the response format. The Foursquare developer can make a decision about the format syntax quickly and move on to his next task. In fact, there is no decision to make at all. How can we help developers make decisions more quickly? We can eliminate unnecessary decisions from their workflow. Knowing that developers make hundreds of simple decisions as they create apps, we can help them by eliminating the superfluous choices from our API design so that our developers can build apps more quickly. As the API team, we're going to have to do a lot with limited resources. It will be easy for us to get overwhelmed. We can have a greater impact on the success of our API by keeping in mind the 80-20 rule. A high percentage of effects in any large system are caused by a low percentage of variables. It is reasonable to assume that 80% of an API's use will come from about 20% of its features. By using API analytics, we can understand which features are in the 20% and which are not, so that we can improve our product roadmap and invest in those highly used features. Likewise, we should expect to see 80% of our API errors coming from 20% of our components. By using API analytics, we can also understand which components are causing the major problems so that we fix the highest impact bugs first. Knowing that we have limited resources and much to do, we can have a greater impact on the success of our API by keeping in mind the 80-20 rule, investing in highly used features and fixing high impact bugs. When a developer approaches a new API, there are many resources competing for his attention. An experienced developer understands some resources will be more important than others. 
As we present information to our developers, we should consider the inverted pyramid principle. Let's take a look. There are many ways to list the resources in our API. One approach that is not very valuable to a developer is also very popular, alphabetically. Let's think about it. In order for a person to use an alphabetical listing, he must know a few things in advance. He must know not only the overall concept he's looking for, like a person, user, or customer, but the specific word that he wants, say person, and how to spell it, P-E-R-S-O-N. Having this much information, and with docs on the web, our developer would probably use his browser search capability to find the resource more quickly. A traditional alphabetical listing of API resources doesn't teach the developer anything he didn't know already, and we've lost an opportunity to communicate an important aspect of our API and our API's intent. From the time we design our API, we will have an idea about which resources are most important. As we accrue data about actual API usage, we'll develop an even better sense of relative importance. We can help developers learn our API and understand its intent by sharing what we know about relative importance of the API. Let's take a look at a few examples. Twilio seems to list their resources in the chronological order a developer would follow when making an app. Create an account, find the available numbers, deal with calls, move on to conferences, and so on. Foursquare is about people going to venues, checking in, and providing tips. And we can see their resources are listed in that order. Likewise, Twitter, who has accrued an enormous amount of data about their API usage, lists their resources in what seems to be order of importance, with timeline, tweets, and people leading the way. Knowing that a developer approaching a new API has to discern which resources are most important, we can use the inverted pyramid principle to present information to our developers in a way that communicates the relative importance of the components of our API. That wraps up our second session on design principles. By being careful not to overwhelm our developers or ourselves, we added six more tangible actions to improve our API initiative. Flavor, favor flexibility, optimize usability, eliminate unnecessary choices, invest in highly used features, fix the high impact bugs. Both of those are driven by insights we gain from API analytics. And finally, list our API resources in order of importance. In the next session, we'll cover part three, don't reinvent the wheel, where we'll tackle three more design principles. Stay tuned. Thank you for tuning into this part. I'm Brian Malloy. You can find me on Twitter at Landlessness or send me an email at brian at apogee.com.